Okay, today our lecture talks about travel demand forecasting and specifically we're talking about two steps in what's referred to as the traditional four-step travel demand model and those steps are trip generation and trip distribution. At the conclusion of today's lecture, students should be able to describe each of the steps in the traditional four-step travel demand model and they should also be able to estimate the number of trips that are produced and attracted within uh, various uh, geographic regions or zones using techniques referred to as trip rates and cross-classification models and then also be able to estimate how many trips are occurring within and across zones using what we refer to as the gravity model. So when we talk about travel demand forecasting what this process entails is essentially estimating how many persons or vehicles are going to travel from point A to point B on a specific route during a given time period. And this estimate, this type of estimate, is going to be important to us because it allows for us to plan for new construction. So let's say we're constructing a new roadway. How much traffic we would expect to use that roadway can be determined through the travel demand forecasting process. And let's say if we're looking to expand facilities, we can use travel demand modeling to estimate where we would be able to best invest our resources for those purposes. And so when we talk about travel demand forecasting or demand modeling, uh, this research and the related models largely date back to the 50s and 60s when there were large-scale highway construction interstate projects going on across the country. And at that point, this forecasting model was developed, which essentially modeled four different travel behavior decisions. The first of those decisions is the reason and choice for a person to travel. So why does a person need to make a trip and when would that trip need to be made? Once they determine that they need to travel for some reason, where are they traveling to? Once they've made that choice, then determining what mode of transportation to use, whether that's personal automobile or transit, such as bus or light rail systems. And then lastly, once they know which mode they're taking, they can select ultimately which route to travel and going from point A to point B. And so these four steps in the travel demand model are referred to as trip generation. In trip generation, we are trying to estimate how many trips will be generated, so how many trips are either starting or ending at a given location and when during the day are these trips occurring. Once we know how many trips are starting and ending within a specific geographic region, we can then distribute those trips across our network. So in trip distribution, we're determining where the origins and destinations of these respective trips are. Once that determination has been made, we're making the mode choice, so whether that person is driving or taking a transit option. And then lastly, traffic assignment. So once we've determined what mode is being utilized, we can determine which of several potential routes would be used to get from point A to point B. And so what we see ultimately then is we see a sequential four-step process where in the first step we're determining how many trips are starting and ending or being produced and attracted within a specific zone. Once we've made that determination, we can determine how many trips occur within each of these zones as well as across each pair of zones. And then we can focus with in each of these specific zones or zonal pairs to determine how much of the traffic between these zones is using one mode versus another. And then once we've made that determination, each of these modes would have several different routes that are available to it. And so the final step is actually assigning all of the traffic to the network, which would give us a fully functioning travel demand model. And so one of the key starting points to this process is defining what our study area is and the way we do that generally is we take the geographic region we're interested in and we break it into a series of traffic analysis zones. And so what traffic analysis zones are, they're essentially geographic representations of different areas of a study region and we try to set up these traffic analysis zones so that they have roughly the same number of trips entering and exiting and the reason for that then is we can develop nice models that relate these trip making characteristics to some of the characteristics of these specific zones such as employment levels uh, income and various other factors that are associated with trip making and so to that end a natural question is what factors are actually influencing travel demand or what can we use to predict travel behavior? And there's a variety of factors here, one of which would be the location and intensity of land use. So if we're looking at a residential area, for example, we'd see a lot of trips occurring around 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning and then between 4 and 6 p.m. 
in the afternoon and evening when people are leaving home for work and then returning from work in the evening. Conversely, if we look at commercial or industrial areas, we would see slightly different trip making characteristics there. Uh, the extent, cost, and quality of transportation services. So is there a transit system available? What is the quality of the infrastructure and the road network? Um, how bad is congestion? Those are all going to have an influence. Uh, the characteristics of the study area, so who lives or works in this area, how well developed is the transportation network. And when we look at these different types of factors, um, a natural question is, well, where do we get access to this type of information in which we can develop these models? And one natural resource there is the census. So every 10 years, we canvass the entire population and we get information on factors such as income and the number of vehicles per household. And as you would expect, if we looked at how travel related to these characteristics, we generally see that higher income households are able to make more trips or tend to make more trips, likewise with households with more vehicles. Uh, another way we collect this sort of information on travel behavior are through travel diaries or travel surveys. So there's a National Household Travel Survey that's conducted on a regular basis, and there's also a long form of the census, which collects more detailed information on travel behavior. And so collectively, we use these various data sources to try to develop empirical models, which we can then use to predict travel behavior ultimately. And so returning back to the first of the four steps in our transportation planning process, that first step, again, is trip generation. So trip generation is basically a process by where we try to estimate how many trips are going to start or end in each of a number of traffic analysis zones within a study area. And so these trips can be related to several characteristics that are associated with trip making. And so this would include characteristics about the trip makers themselves. So if we look at a person's age, income, auto ownership, auto ownership or household size, we would expect to see differences in trip making characteristics across those various parameters. And we'd also expect to be able to relate trip making to characteristics of the development. So we can look at the number of units in a subdivision or an apartment building. We can look at the square footage of a shopping center or the number of parking spaces. And each of these factors is going to have a close relationship, presumably, to trip making as well. And when we look at these types of data, they will tend to be aggregated either at a zonal or a household level. And so the reason we do that, we're not necessarily going to try to predict the individual behavior of every driver in our system or every traveler in our system. Instead, we tend to aggregate across households, and there are several reasons for that, one of which is that census data is collected at the household level. And so what we'll find is if you look at groups of households of similar size and characteristics, so if you look at households with three members and two automobiles, for example, you'll tend to see relatively consistent behavior in terms terms of trip making characteristics within those households and likewise at a zonal level. So this aggregation, it's partly due to convenience in terms of our data sources and it's also easier just from a resource, or resource standpoint for us to develop models at the zonal or household level versus the individual level. And so in trip generation, there are two widely applied rates that are utilized, the first of which is trip rates and the second of which is cross classification. And so starting with trip rates, so when we refer to trip rates, trip rates are essentially just average trip making uh, rates that are related to various characteristics um, about a specific facility type. And we relate trips to some form of activity unit. So for example, let's say we're trying to estimate how many trips are being made into and out of a residential subdivision. So this is coming from a document called ITE Trip Generation, which has an inventory of studies that have been done across the country trying to estimate how many trips would occur given a facility of various sizes. And so what we see right here is a regression model that's relating trip making behavior to the number of homes within a subdivision. And so what you see right here we have an average trip rate, so this is saying roughly there's going to be one trip for every house during the a.m. peak hour period, so during the morning from roughly 7 to 9 a.m. we're going to see a rate of roughly one trip per house, which makes sense. You would presume you'll have uh, on average one commuter going from their home to work within this respective subdivision. 
We also see details here as to the distributions of those trips. So in the morning, we expect to see the majority of traffic is exiting versus entering. So we see roughly a two thirds split here. And we also have down here a fitted curve equation, which can be used to estimate the number of trips that are occurring as a function of the number of homes within that subdivision. And the following figure at the bottom here is similar, although the difference here is that this model is provided for the total number of trips on an entire weekday. So these are the total trips within a day, which gives us a sense of this largely different scale where we're maxing out around 500 up here versus 6,000 down in the bottom graph here. So these models have been developed based on empirical research that's been conducted across the country. Essentially, we had people go out and monitor trip making behavior. And on that basis, we related these trips back to features such as the number of homes in a subdivision. And so this is what we're doing with trip rate analysis. Now, a nice simple example, uh, let's say we've got a zone that includes 220 retail employees and 650 non-retail employees. And we want to be able to estimate how many trips are occurring within that zone. So what we see here is a table of trip rates that have been developed for different trip types on the basis of employment characteristics. And so these trip types or trip purposes, you'll see noted here HBW, HBO, and NHB. This stands for home-based work trips, home-based other or non-work trips, and then non-home-based trips. And the reason we have these different trip classes is because you'll tend to find different predictors potentially or different rates within any of these specific trip types. And so what we see right here, we have a specific number of trips that we would see attracted to each uh, by each of these trip types depending upon the non-retail and retail employment levels. And so just going through this briefly, we see that we have 220 retail employees and so the respective rate of trips per retail employee 1.7 5.0 and 3.0 for the three trip types respectively and we see 650 non-retail workers and so those are applied against the rates we see indicated right here in the non-retail column if we simply multiply the number of workers times the respective trip making rates we can sum across each of those trip types and then just sum these to determine that we would expect on average 5,189 trips per day for a zone with these respective characteristics. So in trip rates, we're ultimately relating one factor to trip making. In this case, we're relating the number of employees within a zone. We can take that one step further and work with what we refer to as cross-classification models as well. So cross-classification models are similar to trip rate models, except we look at a series of characteristics. So instead of just looking at one predictor variable, we're looking at multiple variables. And cross-classification is most commonly used when we're trying to estimate trip making within residential areas. And so what we typically do is we develop these models on the basis of factors like household income, automobile ownership, household size, and as we alluded to on the previous slide, slide, you may have different trip purposes as well. So what we see right here, this is simply a plot that's relating the number of trips made in a household during a given day to household income and automobile ownership. And so what we would do is we would take these sorts of characteristics and we could then develop a series of cross-classification curves. So what we see right here, a series of relationships between automobile ownership and income. And so as you would expect, as income is increasing, we see that automobile ownership is increasing as well. And so this figure here is simply replicating what we're seeing in tabular form right here. And so from this, if we know what the income level is within a specific study area, so if we know what, say, the median household income is, we can determine on that basis what percentage of the population is going to have zero, one, or two automobiles, for example. Uh, continuing, once we've made that determination, so we break the population or the area into
uh, different groups based on auto ownership levels and income, we would expect to see different trip rates within each of those classifications. So as you would expect in the households with no automobiles and low income, we tend to see the lowest number of trips, whereas the highest income groups with the largest number of automobiles, those households tend to make the most trips. And you see that information represented here, both tabularly and graphically. And so using these figures, which were developed as a part of a USDOT study that was conducted back in the 1970s, we can work through an example problem as we see here. So let's say we have a zone that has 60 dwelling units and an average household income of $44,000. So what we see right here, this is simply a distribution of households by income level. And so if we assume an average zonal income of 44,000, we see that 9% of those households would have low income, 40% would have medium income, and 51% would have a high income. Likewise, we could select any other uh, average income within that zone and we see that the distribution within each of those three income levels would then change accordingly. So with that information in hand, we know we have 60 dwelling units, we know the percentage of households within each of the categories. We can then simply refer back to these characteristics we see right here. So the percentage of households in each income category versus auto ownership and the number of trips per household per day within each of those auto income combinations. And so what we're doing right here, we know we have a total of 60 households and of those we have a total of 9% which are falling within the lowest income categories. So we have low income zero autos, low income one auto, low income two autos. And so we see within that low income group, we have 54% of those um, are making one trip per day, 42% of those are making six trips per day, and 4% are making seven trips per day. Likewise, we know that 40% are occurring within that medium income range, and so we know within that range, 4% uh, of those households will have no automobiles on average, 58% will have one, and 38% will have two or more, and so we multiply those respective proportions by the number of trips that are made on average within each of those zones which you see indicated right here. And then likewise, with the high income category, we have 51% of households in the high income group. And then we simply take those respective ratios times the number of trips that are made within those types of uh, households. And we end up with a total of 666 trips across each of these income groups in this 60 household community. So we're seeing on average 11.1 .1 trips per day across those 60 houses. Okay, now when we get to the end of our trip generation step, it's going to be important for us to make sure that our number of productions and our number of attractions are equal to one another. And so when we talk about productions, we're generally talking about the starting point of a trip. And when we talk about attractions, we're talking about the ending point of those trips. And so what that means is we have the same number of trips going into and out of each of our zones. And it's important that the total of those productions and attractions match across our entire study area because otherwise we essentially, it's like we're doing a mass balance equation and we need to make sure that the input is actually equal to the output. And so what we see right here is simply an example where we have home-based work trips in a three zone study area and we see there are 600 trips being produced and 800 trips being attracted to each of these three zones and so obviously that isn't going to work well when we're trying to then uh, determine how many trips are using each of the available roads within these zones. So what we do is we simply scale the attractions on the basis of the productions. Generally the research shows that our model is our models are better in predicting productions and attractions which is why we assume the productions are a better estimate and we then scale the attractions accordingly. So the converse could have also been true here so if we had 800 productions and 600 attractions we would have simply scaled the number of attractions up so that we had a balance then across our system. So all we're doing here, we're just taking each of these numbers and multiplying by three-fourths to scale back so that our productions and attractions are equal to one another. So that brings us to the end of the trip generation step. Now the second step is trip distribution.
So what we're doing in trip distribution is we know how many trips are starting and ending within each zone of our study area. And then we want to be able to distribute those trips across the zone. So we know how many trips start and end in each of these locations. But we want to know exactly how many go from zone 1 to zone 2, from zone 2 to zone 3, and so forth and so on for each of our zones. And so to, to analyze this question, we use what's referred to as the gravity model, which is analogous to Newton's law of gravity, which we're familiar with from physics, where gravitational forces tend to be strongest as the mass of the orbiting bodies increases, or as the distance between them gets smaller, as you see indicated by the m's for the mass and the r for the radius between these bodies here. Well, we do something very similar with trip making. We assume that trips are going to be proportional rather than the mass of the object. They're going to be proportional to how many attractions are generated by a specific zone. So if we have one zone that's attracting 500 trips on average and another zone that's attracting 1,000 trips on average, you would expect twice as many trips to go to the zone that's attracting five. Uh, 1,000 versus 500. Uh, likewise, um, we would expect that fewer trips would be made if the travel time between those zones was larger, or more trips would be made if you have a shorter travel time, which is similar to the radius distance we see in the traditional uh, physics equation. And so the gravity model you see indicated right here, what we're doing with the gravity model is we're predicting how many trips are going from zone I to zone J. And the way we're doing that, we're taking all the trips that are being produced or starting in zone I, and we're allocating those to the other zones on the basis of two primary factors. First of which, A sub J, which is the number of attractions that are being drawn to that specific zone, and F sub IJ. Now, F refers to a friction factor. It's essentially accounting for the effects of travel time. So if we think about travel time, as we alluded to in the previous slide, higher travel times are going to be less desirable. And so what we'll see is that friction is actually inversely related to travel time. So as travel time goes up, your friction factor goes down. And what that means is that lower travel times are more desirable. Lastly, we also have a socioeconomic adjustment factor here, K, which is largely just a calibration factor. And for our purposes, we're generally going to assume that this is simply equal to 1. It essentially would function, um, pardon the term, as a fudge factor, which we would use to help to fit an equation based on empirical data that we're applying in the field. And so when we're applying the gravity model, as I had alluded to, the friction factor is capturing sensitivity of travelers to travel time, basically. And so the way these friction factors are generally determined is a regression qu equation will be developed where for a specific trip uh, in a specific study area, we'll know how likely it is that trips will be made as travel time changes. And so what we see right here, as our travel time is increasing, our friction factor is dropping uh, rather rapidly here. And so what this is, is simply a function that tells us if we know what the travel time is, we can then estimate the friction factor. And that will then give us an indication of how attractive one zone would be um, in comparison to another zone. Uh, the socioeconomic adjustment factor I had referred to previously, so that's simply allowing us to take a model we've developed based on a calibrated friction factor and real observed numbers of predictions and attractions, and basically calibrating that model so that it fits for specific zones in our study network. Now, the best way to go through this is probably through a simple example problem. So let's suppose we have a three-zone study area where zone 1 has 140 productions and 300 attractions, zone 2 has 330 and 270, and zone 3 is 280 productions, 180 attractions. You'll notice here our productions and attractions are balanced at 750. We're given our travel times between the zones, which range from 2 to 6 minutes. And we're also provided with a tabular summary of that friction factor that you saw in the graph on the preceding slide. And so this is telling us how F changes with respect to T. Okay. And so all we're going to do here essentially is just apply this gravity model accordingly. So we'll start with the trips coming out of zone 1. And we know that zone 1 has a total of 140 productions we are determining how many of those 140 are going to stay in zone 1 and how many are going to go to zones 2 and 3 respectively. 
So starting with the internal trips within zone one, we take 140 as our production value. We have 300 attractions for zone one, and our travel time within zone one is five minutes. We see our friction factor that corresponds to that five minute travel time is equal to 39. And on the denominator here, we're simply summing up that same quantity for each of our other zones. Again, assuming that k is equal to 1 here. So we see the same 300 times 39. In zone 2, we had 270 attractions. And the travel time from zone 1 to zone 2 is 2 minutes. And we see 2 minutes has a friction factor of 52. Likewise, for zone 3, we see 180 attractions. We see a three minute travel time, which corresponds to a friction factor of 50. And so on this basis, we would expect to see 47 of those 140 trips would actually remain within zone one. By similar math, you'll see the only thing that's changing here is we'll take a different zonal pair and move it to the top. So trips from one to two, we see there are going to be 57 of those, which are largely, we see this higher number on the basis of this higher friction factor, which corresponds to the lower travel time. And lastly, from zone one to zone three, we see 36 trips and summing those up, we see that totals to 140, obviously. And so this can be done similarly for each of the other zones. And in applying Though that frick, that gravity model across each of the zonal pairs, we end up with this solution in terms of our number of trips from one to each of the other zones, from two to each of its partner zones, and from zone three to each of the other zones as well. Now what you'll notice by definition here, since we're just taking the proportion of those total trips that are produced in each of the zones, our productions are going to match just by by definition, by mathematics. However, what we'll find is that when we apply that model, while our productions will match, our attractions will not necessarily match, which is going to be problematic to us. And so this first iteration is singly constrained and that productions match, but you'll notice the attractions do not match. So what we'll need to do here is we're going to actually develop new attraction values for each of these zones. So what we found is that we are tending to Overpredict trips in zone one, we're underpredicting trips in each of the other two zones. So all we're going to do is we're going to take our given or what our, our known or actual attraction values are, and we're going to multiply that by the ratio of the given to the computed values. And so what this does is it scales our estimates either down or up accordingly. And so our attractions for zone one during the second iteration are going to be 237 rather than 300. And we'll scale up the attractions for zone two and zone three respectively. And so what happens here then is we're simply reapplying the gravity model. You'll notice there's subtle changes here. Uh, we still have the same constraint of 140 productions within zone one. But when we look at our totals, in the attractions, we'll see that they've converged to almost the exact same um, values here. And so consequently, this would be a doubly constrained model in where the total number of productions and attractions in each of our zones are essentially balanced. And so this is just a very brief demonstration of how we estimate how many trips go between two specific zones on the basis of travel time and attraction data.